this uh, past week I visited with uh, three families and uh, went to their homes and, and afterwards as I was leaving each one I was reminded of the same thing and I was reminded that no one has a perfect family, okay? Every family has its broken places. The only difference between uh, from one family to the next is that some uh, camouflage the brokenness a little bit better than others. But we all have families, um, and in those families, there is some brokenness. My family is no different. You could go back just one generation, maybe two, could go back three. But in my family tree, there's addiction issues and affairs and time spent in the state penitentiary and divorce and bankruptcies and teenage mothers and even more than a few horse thieves. If you look and listen, you will discover some frailties and failures in your family tree too. Every family has its broken places. So we shouldn't be that surprised when the apostles struggle in their relationships with one another. I mean, think about it for a minute. For three years, they lived and they served side by side. They became like family because of so much time and their common purpose together. And think about this too. If the apostles are, are like a family together, guess who the head of their family was? It was Jesus. That's a pretty neat idea. Like every family, those apostles occasionally got on one another's nerves. Immediately following the Last Supper, which we're celebrating this evening, Luke tells us that an argument broke out among the disciples. They were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Now, it's not clear what measuring stick they were using to determine greatness and, and, and value and all of that. I suppose one of them was talking about, well, I, I've brought in the most new recruits. And maybe another one said, well, I've done the most baptisms. And maybe another one, hey, I've done more healings than anyone else. And maybe another one, um, wow. Wow. Well, I'm directing more small groups than you are. You know, it goes on and on. We don't know, but what we do know is that they were very much like family, and every family has its broken places. It's interesting that, that following one of the most intimate experiences and ex, uh, experiences with Jesus, the Last Supper, is when this argument breaks out. Isn't that incredible? Just being close to Jesus doesn't make everything work well at home, does it? For the apostles, the pride and, and their self-centeredness rears its ugly head. Just a few moments after they began cleaning up after the Last Supper and before they moved to the garden for prayer. It's clear that the apostles are far from perfect, and that ought to be a word of hope for all of us because we all know we're not perfect either. Judas will betray Jesus, Peter will reject Jesus, and the whole group will hide and run in the closet as soon as Jesus is arrested. Where is their faith? Where is their courage? Where is their strength? And then when things are tough in our lives, maybe we ask ourselves those same questions. Where is our faith? Where is our courage? Where is our strength? And when we begin to focus on the brokenness in our lives or our frailties or our, our, our failures, it becomes easy to feel as if those things are maybe going to be too much for Jesus to get past in our life. We begin to feel that Jesus would never want to draw close to us or to have us draw close to him. In the midst of their frailty and failures, Jesus reassures the disciples that he will not abandon them, he will not forget them, and he's surely not going to push them off to the side someplace. Listen to Luke uh, chapter 22, verse 27. Jesus says to the disciples, but I have been with you, I have been with you as a servant. Jesus re reaffirms that he has been with them through the good times and the difficult times. He's been there all along. He's been with them as the Son of God. He's been with them as the Savior. He has been with them as a friend and even as a humble servant. So when the disciples are drifting away, Jesus invites them to draw near again. 
When the disciples are feeling afraid and alone, Jesus invites them to draw near again. When the disciples' hearts are filled with pride or filled with pain, Jesus invites them to draw near again. Why? Because he is with them. The good news is even when the brokenness leads them away from Jesus, the disciples are reminded over and over that all along the way, Jesus has been with them. Jesus also takes a moment to remind the disciples that he will be with them in the future too. You can look at Luke chapter 22 verse 30 and Jesus says, you will, this is future tense, you will eat and drink with me in my kingdom. This is a promise of eternal life. You're going to eat and drink with me in my kingdom. But there's more to this than just the promise of heaven someday. Jesus says they'll eat and drink with him in heaven. Jesus is describing something very similar to what they've just experienced in the Last Supper. Think of this. The Last Supper is kind of a small little glimpse of the heavenly banquet table where we will be gathered with Jesus in heaven. It's a pretty incredible thought. You see, Jesus shows the disciples here that in this life and in the life to come, it's all about drawing near to Jesus and kind of having this intimate, close relationship with him. Our sharing in the Last Supper this evening is, is an opportunity for us to draw near to Jesus, but also to receive the assurance that we will be near Jesus in heaven someday. We can draw near to Jesus in prayer. Now here's a sequence. We have the Last Supper, and then we have this argument amongst the disciples, and there's just a little bit of conversation there, and then Jesus packs up the whole group, and they walk over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And from that moment until he is arrested, Jesus is there, and Jesus is doing one thing. He's engaged in prayer, and it's a gut-wrenching kind of prayer. Luke tells us while Jesus prayed, the sweat dropped from his forehead and fell to the ground like droplets of blood. That's not normal. That's not normal. Jesus had one purpose in this prayer time, for his desire to become one with the Father's desire. See what Jesus is doing in the prayer time there? He's drawing closer and closer to the Father's heart. If we want to draw closer to the Lord, the way we begin that is in prayer. We draw closer and closer to the Father's heart. Some of our most important soul work will be engaging in prayer for the purpose of drawing near to Jesus. We can bring our brokenness and our failures and our mess-ups to the conversation because Jesus is never surprised by any of that. We can bring our praise and our worship and our celebration to the conversation because Jesus rejoices with us. And we can wait, and we can be still, and we can listen for Jesus' word and Jesus' way because Jesus is eager to lead us closer to his heart. The promise of Jesus is for all who draw near his heart. The Last Supper reminds us that Jesus walks with us in this life and will eat and drink with us in heaven. It's a promise of this intimate and close relationship with the Son of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your love in Jesus. We thank you for the guidance and powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Without you, all those broken places in our families and in our lives and in our world, well, there would be no hope. There'd be no help. There'd be no healing. Because by ourselves, we just can't keep it all together. We need something. And you've known what that has been since the beginning of time. And so you gave us all this time to, to learn that you are the source of our hope and our help and our healing. 
but we just couldn't get it. And then at the right time, in the right place, and for the right reason, you sent your son Jesus. You sent him to show us how to live and how to love. And not just as individuals, but in our marriages and in our parenting and amongst our siblings and all around in our families and at the workplace and in our schools and in our communities and in our global community as well. And so we turn to Jesus to see how to live and how to love in a way that grows healthier and holy relationships. With you, of course, Father, but also with our families and our friends and our community. We remember that Last Supper, how after three years of serving and healing and loving and teaching and preaching and holding and caressing, that Jesus gathered those 12 disciples in a room they were there as a small group, but they were, they were ready to share in the Passover meal. And everything went according to tradition and custom and culture and faith until that moment when Jesus lifted up some bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to you, Father, and then he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And amazingly, they ate the bread. And then they continued through the Passover meal, through all the elements on the plate. And they heard the talks and they remembered their story. And then again, rather surprisingly, Jesus lifted up a cup of wine. It wasn't in the script. But he gave you thanks, Father, and then he said to them, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we pray as we celebrate the Last Supper this evening, Lord God, that you, Lord, that you would take the loaf and the cup and you would make them become for us the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, for the redemption of our souls, for the assurance of eternal life in heaven but also as an opportunity for us to draw near to you again. We thank you for your amazing grace that would allow that possibility. We thank you for your tender mercies that forgive and give us another chance. And we thank you, Lord, for your spirit always working in our lives to draw us closer to your heart. So we thank you. as we draw near to you now. We ask our prayers and these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen.